Well, my name is Linda Martin, and I am part of the team, and we call ourselves, here in the Indivisibles, we call ourselves Warriors for Reproductive Justice. And we're very proud to call ourselves that. Some of us have been working on this issue for 50 years, believe it or not. I know we all look young, so you can't believe that, that we would do that. But. And one of the reasons I'm especially interested in uh, what things were like back then, and that's the part of the program we've reached, is that I myself had an abortion when I was in my 20s, early 20s. Um, but this is really not about me. That's, that's what really motivated me to start working on this issue. Uh, and I worked all the way through to um, Susan, wherever Susan went, and Susan and I worked on the HPV together. Uh, and we're still putting out posters for HPV. But what I want you to know today is that you're going to hear some incredible stories. Uh, some of these stories were admitted, were submitted to us anonymously because people were not willing to speak these words to you in person. Now, I understand that because this is a very small town. Uh, back in 92, you may remember that Roe v. Wade was challenged, and the, I lived in Washington, and the Washington Post had a two-page, an open spread, with names of all the women who were willing to have their name published, and this was sponsored by Planned Parenthood. So there were thousands of women's names, including mine, on this page in the Washington Post. But this is Port Townsend, and we're 10,000 people, so I understand why it might be a little different here. Um, I want to introduce you first to Cherry Van Hoover, who, has, who wants to share the story of a family member of hers who died from an illegal abortion. And I wanna say one more thing. It's kind of a miracle that I'm standing here today because when I had my illegal abortion, I was living alone and I almost died. And it's just, to me, it is um, unthinkable. This is Gracie's story. Gracie May Prestige was born on February 19th, 1897. She was the fourth child out of six and the second girl. Her sister Coral was the oldest and then came two boys, Oscar and Harry. Gracie was sandwiched between those two boys and two who were younger, Charles and Walter. Her parents were Lucius and Edith, and she was my grandfather's cousin. The Prestige family lived on a farm in Bethel Township just outside Bronson, Michigan, halfway between Chicago and Detroit and straight north of Fort Wayne. To this day, very few people live in Bronson. We don't know much about Gracie. We don't know what she looked like or what she liked best to do. We don't know her dreams or aspirations. That's because we do know this. Obituary of Gracie May Prestige, Bronson Journal, 15th November, 1912. Gracie May Prestige, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Lucius H. Prestige, was born 19th of February, 1897, in Bronson. Monday, November 11th, at 1.15 a.m., she passed away at the home of her parents in Bethel Township after a two weeks illness at the age of 15 years, eight months, and 22 days. She has spent her short life in Bronson and Bethel Townships living in Bronson the first 10 years and Bethel the remainder of her life. The funeral was held at the ME Church in Bronson Tuesday, November 12th with interment in Bronson Cemetery. And that would have been the only time young Gracie's name ever would have been reported in the newspaper, except one week later, she was newsworthy once again. From Bronson Journal, 22nd November, 1912, inquest held Wednesday. Jury impaneled last Saturday met Wednesday to hear evidence relating to the death of Grace Prestige. 
The death of Grace Prestige, which occurred early Monday morning, November 11th, has been the means of stirring up considerable excitement throughout the county. On the strength of rumors and suspicions, owing to the quick interment of the body, an investigation was instigated by prosecuting attorney Cowell, which resulted in the exhuming of the remains. This was done last Saturday in the presence of doctors Baldwin and Legg of Coldwater and Mowry of Bronson. A jury composed of H.C. Bowker, J.P. Allen, E.P. Moses, David Gibbs, Chaz Somerlot, and Herbert Freeman was impaneled, and after viewing the body, adjourned until Wednesday when the inquest was held at the town hall. The testimony of Lucius Prestige, father of the dead girl, and the three doctors was taken, after which the jury was left to consider their verdict. After a short consideration, the following verdict was returned. That on the evidence offered, said deceased Grace Prestige came to her death from peritonitis caused by a criminal operation. Yes, the neighbors were abuzz with rumors and suspicions, so the law stepped in and they dug up poor Gracie so three male doctors could examine what was left of her. And then those three male doctors presented evidence of their findings and, their, and her father was questioned before a panel of six male jurors who also viewed her ravaged body and then delivered judgment. Peritonitis caused by a criminal operation. So let's just pause for a moment to think about what that two-week illness was like for Gracie and her family. The symptoms of peritonitis are fever, severe abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, fluid filling the abdomen, extreme thirst, delirium. It wasn't an easy death, but there's no mention of a doctor coming to call or help being sought during those two weeks when the family tried to hide their shame and Gracie's criminal operation. They kept her home, and they didn't call for assistance, and they rushed her into the grave in only one day. So quickly, the neighbors started to talk. But the November 22nd article doesn't end there. It goes on. Last Monday, Henry Waite of this place was arrested by Deputy Sheriff Miller and was taken to Coldwater, where he furnished bonds for his appearance at a hearing to be held today, Friday. His arrest was on the charge of a serious offense and was made on the basis of statements made by the parents of the dead girl. Mr. Waite has employed the firm of Palmer and Palmer to represent him. Henry Waite? Who the heck was he? At that time, Henry Waite was a 65-year-old widowed wage earner. In the past, he had worked on farms and driven a dray wagon, transporting general goods. Was he in the habit of performing criminal operations for all and sundry, or did he have a special interest in young Gracie? Hard saying, but I am reminded of an individual who lived in our own community documented by Betty McDonald in her thinly disguised memoir, The Egg and I. I'd like to digress for just a moment and read this passage about the abortion she was offered as a 21-year-old newlywed when driving with her husband from their home in Chimicum to Port Townsend in 1928. One day, when Bob and I were driving to town, a man hailed us. We stopped and he climbed on the running board and leaned into the car confidentially. Say, he said, heard you was that way. Yes, I said, I am. The man leaned in farther so that his face was uncomfortably close to mine. Just say the word and I'll fix you up. Drop up some evening with six dollars and I'll fix you good as new. Not a thing to it, he said, winking at Bob. Took care of Mrs. Smith when she was six months along. Got rid of three for my own wife at three months. Just a plain old-fashioned button hook, nothing to it. Oh, him, the girl in the doctor's office said. Uh, his wife's in the hospital right now, recovering from her last abortion. We get his work in here all the time, and she laughed heartily. I didn't think it was funny. Why don't they stop him? Why don't they arrest him? The girl sighed and looked out the window. 
If it wasn't him, it'd be someone else. If they can't find someone else to do it, they abort themselves. The hospital's full of them all the time. Button hooks, bailing wire, hat pins. God, they're dumb. And then Betty concludes with her own words of judgment. Not dumb, pitifully ignorant. Odd that she didn't think to mention desperate, but then Betty was most definitely a woman of her times, and we should be grateful to her for recording it, what the situation was right here in our own Jefferson County. But back to Henry Waite. Information after this news report about his arrest is scant, and I haven't found any record of his trial. I do know, however, that four and a half years later, on April Fool's Day, 1917, he shot himself in the head and died. But next I'd like to introduce you to somebody that I've just met, interesting, just met recently. Uh, Catherine, who worked as a nurse midwife in Cook County, Illinois. Illinois. Did I say Illinois? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm from Missouri, so don't tell. Uh, Catherine worked in Cook County and will share what she witnessed there and be ready to be surprised. Catherine? Well, first of all, I should tell you that I'm a certified nurse midwife. Now, you might wonder what that is, and um, it kind of goes along with my story um, because it started a long, long time ago when I was a student midwife um, in 1972, so definitely pre uh, Roe versus Wade. Uh, midwife, of course, attends women in labor and birth, um, as well as provides women's health care across the lifespan. So, in fact, currently, um, I do um, still teach um, just one course. I retired from the university about a year ago, uh, where I was teaching nurse practitioners and nurse midwives for many years. And currently, I work a little bit with Susan um, at the public health clinic when she needs a day off. So um, my story goes back um, to 1972, so almost 47 years ago when I was a student um, nurse midwife in our at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and our clinical was at Cook County Hospital, which is a huge public hospital that serves um, Chicago and inner city Chicago, as well as the surrounding county, and also the Cook County Prison, which I had a number of women come over from the prison to have their babies chained to the delivery table. Very humane. Uh, most of my time, of course, was spent in the labor ward um, or with the birthing women. Uh, but we also, uh, of course, cared for the women on the postpartum ward, uh, you know, for days uh, because at that time you stayed in the hospital after you had a baby for about a week. Um, and if you had surgery, which was pretty rare then, um, you would stay for longer than that, like maybe 10 days. Of course, now you barely stay a couple of days, even if you've had surgery, but maybe that's a good thing. So um, I also um, had uh, visits to a ward in Cook County Hospital that was the award for the women that had gynecologic surgery. So they were post-op. And many of the women there um, had, had uh, abortions. Uh, and of course, at the time, these were illegal abortions. Um, and there were many there that had a variety of injuries. Um, everything from perforated uterus, which you just heard um, results in peritonitis and other problems, but you've heard, you know, the symptoms of that, so I won't, you know, repeat that. It's horrible. Um, women had injuries um, to their bowel and bladder. They had often hemorrhaged. They had infections. They often lost their uterus because it was so lacerated, giving up any opportunity uh, in the future when they wanted to have a planned pre pregnancy. So many of them um, were really on death's door. And there was one particular woman 
that really I cared for that had gangrene of the bowel. And you can add all of the symptoms that Sherry just talked about in addition to terrible odor. And so it was difficult to take care of her. Needless to say, this made a lasting impression on me. I knew that abortion and contraception really needed to be legal and to protect these women. And I also know that contraception and abortion are related to maternal and child health. A woman can be too young or too old or lacking in health or, or support, living in poverty, raped, or other difficulties that make pregnancy and childbirth a dangerous business. I think you probably know that there are a large number of women dying in the United States every year with maternal mortality, especially uh, African American and Native women. 700 women die every year in the United States and it's increasing. We know that over 40% of pregnancies are unplanned and repeated close pregnancies when a woman is not in good health result in increased maternal mortality and morbid morbidity. Contraception and abortion services are critical components for safe motherhood and for healthy women in our society. We must keep safe and legal abortion and contraception available. We must be pro-choice and pro-life of the woman. Women are so much more than baby containers and babies deserve to be loved and wanted. Now we have another one of those people who uh, was not willing to speak for herself, but she has asked that uh, her story be told, uh, his story. This is the story of a retired physician and it will be read by Mara Lathrop. Mara? Back in those days it was just a doctor and a nurse in the office, no medical assistants or technicians around. We recorded it as a spontaneous separation of the placenta. Only the nurse and I knew the truth. The husband had brought her in. Their oldest boy had found her on the floor in the kitchen. The skirt of her dress was covered with blood. The husband didn't look upset. He looked angry. He dropped her off and told us to call him when she was ready to go home. She was only semi-conscious and still actively bleeding. While I was examining her, she passed the remains of a fetus that was about two to three months along. It was ripped and torn clearly as the result of deliberate action. The nurse and I looked at each other, both knowing exactly what had caused this, but not saying it out loud. The patient was still bleeding and needed to get to an operating room as quickly as possible, so I packed her vagina tightly with gauze and had the nurse call for an ambulance to get her to the hospital. I told the nurse to stay with her and said, we need to find out what she fell from that might have caused this. The nurse knew exactly what I meant when I said it. A few hours later, my nurse reported back that the patient was awake when my nurse had asked the patient what she had fallen from, the patient replied that she had slipped going into the cellar. I wasn't there, but I imagine this patient waking up in a strange place with a nurse beside her asking strange questions. As long as everyone stuck to the lie, we were all safe. It went in the records that way, placental separation after a fall. The hospital gave her antibiotics in a few days of bed rest to recover. She had three other kids at home. I don't think that she was what we called back then a battered wife. I was the doctor of their boys and I never saw her with bruises. But because he didn't hit her, didn't mean that this marriage needed another child. I never asked and she never told. Had she done this to herself or had she paid someone? 
She was lucky, this patient. She was already a mother and married. That let us record the botched abortion like we did. I thought about it for a long time afterwards. If a teenage girl came in with this, how would I have recorded it? How could I have lied to make life a little easier for a young girl who found herself in the same situation? The patient didn't die. She went back home to her family. My nurse moved away from town a few years later, and a few years after that, I moved as well. Now we have another story that is going to be read by uh, Timothy Singler. My mother was a social worker whose caseload was um, called unwed mothers back in the 50s. And um, I didn't, we didn't find out until she was what, Mari, 95? Late, late 90s, just before, not long before she died that she had worked and set up an underground railroad for these women that most of had been from rape or incest or um, to, to, so they could get legal abortions at a university. I, I didn't realize, um, I, I thought this would be reasonably you know, easy for me to read. I'm surprised. Um, the, the woman's story. In 1970, I was 15 and pregnant. I didn't know what to do. I lived in a very conservative state where abortion was illegal. It was legal in New York, but by the time that I realized what was going on and my parents discovered my situation, I was past 12 weeks. My alternatives were limited. I would carry to term and adopt out. My parents heard of an attorney who had some clients that wanted to adopt. Everything was arranged through the lawyer. He had found a woman for me to live with. She took in pregnant girls for a fee and took care of them until the baby was born. I lived with her about five months in isolation and in secrecy. Nobody, nobody was allowed to know. The culture didn't accept or support unmarried girls who got pregnant. Most were sent to homes for unwed mothers. Institution, institutions that had, were well known for bad treatment of unwed mothers. So I was considered lucky to live in a private home but I think I would have been better off to go to one of the institutions because I was so isolated and I was so lonely. I sulked in self-shame, shame and guilt. The woman was kind, but hardly ever home. She fed me, housed me, but it was like living someone else's life. It, it was surreal. I mostly ate cereal all day, watched TV, and was too depressed and scared to study at my, quote, at home, end quote, school lessons, or do anything else productive. On those rare occasions that my parents came to visit and suggested going out for a meal, I was petrified to go out into the world, too afraid to be seen And, and to be ostracized for being a pregnant teenager. I felt like a pariah. I hated my body, my body ever getting larger, and I hated my life. I so much wanted it all to come to an end. In 1970, it was legal for schools to ban unmarried pregnant girls from attending class. I believe I was kept out of school primarily for social reasons, to protect my reputation. I'd never be able to fit back into my community if my pregnancy was discovered or known. This pregnancy meant that I was missing a year of school. I ended up having to repeat my sophomore year of school. 
I had turned 16 just a few weeks before I went into labor. I had never been given any information about birthing. I had no idea what was to take place. My mother went with me to the hospital. I'd been getting prenatal care by an awful, very punitive male doctor who let me know what a despicable girl I was. When I went to the hospital, I was treated very rudely by the nurses in the maternity section. They told my mother it would be hours until I delivered and sent her away, saying they would call her when the time came close. That's when my nightmare began. I was given Pitocin, enough to induce labor, I was given enough Pitocin for a herd of elephants, it seemed like, and the labor started and it came on hard almost instantly. I was terrified. My screams and behavior were treated brutally. I was given more drugs. This time, a hallucinogen that was supposed to put a woman into, quote, twilight sleep for the duration of the delivery. My arms and legs were strapped to the bed. I went in and out of lucid consciousness, and occasionally a nurse came in and told me to, quote, keep quiet, end quote, that I was disturbing the other birthing mothers. I wanted my mom, but the staff made it clear that a girl like me didn't deserve to have any comforts. I was hysterical. Afterward, I would notice bruises on my throat where I had been physically restrained. Nowadays, the treatment I experienced is called obstetric violence. But I had no sense of being a victim. I was being punished. That was the message I was left with, that I deserved what I got. It had taken me, it has taken me a lifetime to recover. How long might it take other young girls to recover from such treatment? I suspect some of them never did. Nowadays, birth mothers are able to choose the parents for their child. They meet with them in advance, and the birth mothers can get updates on how the child is doing. That was unheard of in those times. I never saw the baby I delivered. I was moved out of maternity and into some other ward, no babies around, just me alone with my aching and empty body. And I have no idea how this child's life turned out. Before women had a choice, the adoption process and the people involved didn't have to be nice to girls who were pregnant. We were bad for getting pregnant. So it was okay for doctors and, abor and abortion, and I'm sorry, and adoption agencies to treat us badly. And I hope this sharing of this story, I can help prevent any other young women from experiencing this same kind of thing. Thank you. I'd like to introduce my friend, Karen, who has come to share her story who found out she was pregnant at, or no, I'm sorry, who had to travel overseas in 1967 to share the same experience that Timothy's girl did. Uh, this story is um, not nearly as dramatic or was not traumatizing like the other stories you've heard, but it's an interesting commentary on an alternative that I suspect a lot of people took advantage of back then, and back then was 1967. It was fall, uh, I was getting ready to go into my third year of school at Portland State University. Found out I was pregnant or missed a couple periods, was thinking, you know, is this really happening to me? And, and, and yes, it was. First person I went to uh, 
and I cannot remember why, was my dance instructor. And she sent me to her obstetrician gynecologist, this is in Portland, Oregon, and he gave me what was probably the precursor to the morning after pill. And he said, if this doesn't bring on uh, your period, then we'll talk. And I took the pill, nothing happened. Um, he said, okay. Uh, he said, I'm not quite sure what you should do now. Uh, there, it, abortions are illegal here. Uh, they're legal in other countries. Uh, you might want to talk to your parents. And so I took a big breath and went to my mother, which was a very scary thing to do. However, my mother was amazing and very non-judgmental. And she said, you know, I had a couple of those myself. The person that she had them from was Ruth Barnett. Ruth Barnett was famous in Portland. She provided over 40,000 abortions to women in the Portland area and from far away in the early part of the 20th century up until about 1967 when I needed her. 40,000 abortions and not a single mortality. Um, there's a book written about her. I put a little flyer on the back table. Um, I did not get to experience her kind and um, very, very um, good hands in my pro at my problem. So my mother uh, said, okay, uh, let's look into this a little bit. We went back to the doctor that I had been to. He said, you know, I have a, a doctor acquaintance who's working at the American Hospital over in Tokyo. You might consider that. Here's his name. It was either, at that time, it was either Japan or England. For some reason, probably because of this doctor, he said, we decided that I was going to go to Tokyo. I was 20 years old. Was I 20? Yeah, I was 20 years old in the dance program in Portland State. This was 1967. I had long blonde hair. Never been on an airplane in my life. Um, my mom arranged this through a travel agent. Um, we talked to the doctor. He said, it's probably going to cost about $500. Uh, she gave me $500, uh, arranged for my flight. We went to the Portland airport. This is back at the pre-TSA time, so she could see me off at the gate. Um, and you dressed up back then to fly, right? I was all dressed up. Just before I left, she gave me her St. Christopher's medal. Her St. Christopher's medal was one that she and my dad had both gotten before World War II, and to keep him safe while he was fighting in World War II, and to keep her safe while she was waiting for him to come home. So clutching my St. Christopher's medal, I get on, I think it was probably TWA flight to Japan, flew for a long time. Landing in Japan, this was the time of Red China, landing in Japan, you couldn't go in gently. You had to stay out of red Chinese airspace and go land like this. Um, the stewardesses were hanging onto the back seats of the seats to climb up the aisle, and I was clutching this metal so hard that I wore a groove in my finger that actually bled by the time I got off the plane. Got off the plane, went to a hotel that I think had probably been arranged by a travel agent, and the next day I took the slip of paper with the doctor's name on it to the American hospital. The nice people there told me that the doctor was no longer there. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty naive, and I've never been overseas before, never been on a plane. This was all very, um, I have no idea, no recollection how I got through this, but they said the doctor's no longer there, but he worked with a man who just opened a clinic in Tokyo, and maybe I should go see him. All this time, I was followed around Tokyo by really, really polite, lovely Japanese people who asked if they could touch my hair. <laughs> it was just, it was a very strange and surreal experience. The clinic was a lovely little place down a very quiet side street. Um, it was, as I recall, a very Japanese-looking house, only one or two stories. I went in, they took me in, they said yes, they could take care of me, uh, gave me a room. It took a day or two for something to happen, exams, I guess, or whatever. I remember looking out the window of this little quiet street and seeing children going to school in their little uniforms, and everything was so quiet and peaceful and, 
and contained and lovely. I felt so safe. The first morning I was there, they brought me a plate of breakfast. They were very proud of it. It was a piece of ham, a beautiful fried egg, a piece of toast, and a cup of coffee, and they were all ice cold. <laughs> but they were beautifully presented. And I said, you know, this is lovely, but I'd really like some, Ch some Japanese food. And they were thrilled. They were just ecstatic that I had asked to have their food. I was treated very well. Uh, I remember nothing of the procedure. Uh, I was uh, in the clinic for two or three days. I went back to the hotel for a day. I got on the plane. My mom had said, you know, stop in Hawaii. The planes always stopped in Hawaii. Then stop in Hawaii. Your dad had such a wonderful uh, memory of Hawaii in World War II. I stopped in Hawaii for one day and I thought, you know, I just need to go home. I went home and it was, um, I was fine, you know, it was, a, it was a legal procedure, it was carefully carried out, I had no repercussions, I had no guilt, I had an amazingly supportive, non-judgmental mother and father, um, they took care of me in the way that we all should take care of our kids and we all should be taken care of. It wasn't until years later that my mother told me two things. The first one was that they'd had to take out a second mortgage on the house to finance the flight and the doctor's fees and the hotel. I had no idea. This was a house we bought when I was three years old in 1950. Um, looking back at my mother's papers after she died, she was paying $79 a month mortgage, but she had to take out a second loan on the house. And the other thing she told me was that the gate, seeing me get on the plane and the plane take off was the hardest thing she'd ever had to do in her life. So, a good story. Um, not traumatic for me, a uh, little traumatic for her, I'm afraid, but that was my story. Tonight's speakers have shared incredibly useful information with us. We've heard details of programs, we've learned about the legal situation we face, and we've heard personal stories from our communities. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you to our guest speakers. We look forward to hearing your ideas, and if you have not contributed to Our Lady of Choice and wish to do so, please do. Thank you very much. Thanks.